Unlike several of the previous speakers, I, I'm not really going to specifically address any of the big uh, the issues about uh, uh, details about tanks and so on. My whole idea is described here is to, to describe the major science issues and only on the atmospheric transport and dispersion modeling aspects of it. And my uh, background on this, um, I have a degree in meteorology and I've spent my career just doing uh, boundary layer meteorology analysis and transport and dispersion model development applications. And, I, and back in the 1980s, I, I wrote uh, the book Vapor Cloud Guidelines and Vapor Cloud Dispersion Modeling for the CCPS, Center for Chemical Process Safety of the AICHE. So uh, since then, uh, you know, I seem to have gotten involved in a whole lot of this type of thing and have worked on this for the past 30 or 40 years. Okay. And I also want to stress that all I'm going to be talking about is topics in my narrow area. Uh, I, I do a lot of uh, studies with other people of chemical accidents where we have a team and there are people who know about the emissions. They provide me with the emissions information. I then do the modeling analysis, produce concentrations, dosages or whatever hand it over to the exposure people and risk assessment people. So I, my work is just in this little narrow area. Somebody else does the other things. And what I'm going to try and do is give a, a broad brush cover, coverage of what I think are the important scientific topics related to transport dispersion of ammonia. And uh, though these are listed here. Uh, one of them is bo the buoyancy issue, which has been discussed before. Another is ambient stability. And then uh, things that Eli and Tom and others have discussed, the interactions of the cloud with ambient water removed by chemical reactions and deposition. And Tom Spicer addressed that fairly well already. And, uh, and then cloud behavior after the density or buoyancy effects go away. The topography area will be covered, I believe, by Jacques Moussafir in his talk, uh, modeling of the uh, issues in uh, Haifa and other uh, areas where there's significant topography. <coughs> and then I will briefly cover the differences between operational and research applications. I'll try and spend most of my time on reviewing the available models and then talking about evaluations with ammonia field data. So we've talked a whole lot so far about buoyant versus dense plumes. And uh, I wanted to stress that bottom point there that the density of any gas is determined by its temperature. As the temperature goes up, the density goes down. Molecular weight, as the molecular weight goes up, the density goes up. Fraction of liquid embedded, uh, as that goes up, the density goes up. So there's a big difference when you consider the, the photographs and stories of uh, ammonia plume behavior. And this has been stressed by many people today. If it's a, stored as a refrigerated liquid, then the liquid spill is likely to have a, evaporation. It will be a, a gas which is buoyant. And we've been doing plume rise uh, modeling for years and it's fairly well known. If it's stored as a pressurized liquefied gas, then you have the additional uh, two-phase with the droplets contributing to the density. So you, you really have to watch out when people are showing pictures of accidents and describing them that uh, generally the plume that's hugging the ground is from a pressurized release. So I have a couple of pictures here. This is just a standard picture of buoyant plume rise, 
And you can see this in Israel by driving between Tel Aviv and Haifa, and there's many stacks. You can see buoyant plumes. In this case, there's a, a white cloud there. It's probably fog water. And even though it looks like there's a lot of it, the density is not enough to make the plume dense. This is a chlorine plume, and I want to emphasize that this chlorine has a molecular weight larger than that of air, as opposed to ammonia with a molecular weight less than that of air. So we've been doing field experiments in the past uh, few years at Dugway Proving Ground with the chlorine, as was pointed out earlier by George and others, chlorine is much more uh, toxic than ammonia, and therefore most of the emphasis of this these field experiments have been on chlorine rather than ammonia. But here you can see the plume going up. Well, I guess there's a pointer here, but... Anyway, you can see the plume rising from the source on the left, and that's a gas plume. Even though it's sort of ye yellowish, that's not a liquid aerosol. It's actually the gas you're looking at. So the gas goes up about 40 meters, and then because of its density due to the excess molecular weight, it d drops, you can see it dropping down to the ground about 80 meters away. So this is what happens if you have a plume with excessive density, a very large plume. So is a plume from an refrigerated liquid spill buoyant or dense? Uh, well, ammonia has a molecular weight much less than that of air. People have been showing the numbers, say it's 40% less than air. And, the, uh, and it will always be buoyant, and you can do this calculation yourself no matter what the ambient temperature and the ambient water content. So the, those two things are not enough to counter the buoyancy. And the plume rise depends on the amount that's being evaporated, the mass rate that's going into the air. For large spills, it can be as much as 100 meters or more. And the, the bottom of the plume will uh, be aloft and will not diffuse to the ground for a while. That's the scenario Eli was discussing of, I guess, the Chernobyl plume. Because of its large buoyancy, it went up high and so it didn't affect the nearby people. And then the next topic is inversions. We've heard a lot about inversions, you know, like uh, you have an inversion and it holds the pollutants down near the ground. Well, the, actually what the an inversion and stability will do is it'll reduce the turbulence and dispersion but the atmosphere is always turbulent, so it never cuts it off entirely. And the, uh, if when the temperature increases with height, it can reduce the dispersion. It also will reduce the plume rise, but it, it depends on the amount of buoyancy in the plume, because a buoyant plume can break up through a, a dense inversion if it has enough energy to it. Then the interactions with ambient water vapor and fog drops. This question has come up uh, quite a bit. And uh, in the past, I f was finding I couldn't find a lot of good information about this, about the chemistry of this. So I sent some messages around uh, three or four weeks ago to people I know who are atmospheric chemists and know about ammonia. And uh, so what I'm giving you is what the consensus was of the people atmospheric chemists who responded that there would be little or no reaction of water vapor in the gas phase with ammonia gas. And as Eli pointed out and others, that you could have 5% of the volume of ambient air on a hot, humid summer day being water vapor, but it's not reacting with the ammonia gas, according to what I am told. Maybe that's a subject for future research. And then the other issue is, well, how much does it react with the fog? And one main point there is the, even though you can't see through a fog, it looks very dense, it really doesn't have all that much uh, content, water content. It's about a tenth of a percent of the mass of the air has this uh, liquid fog. So there's 
only that much available. And then I was told by the chemist there's, there's something called Henry's constant, which determines the equilibrium between the gas concentration and the concentration in the water, and all that has to be considered. So I, I'm not sure if anybody has ever modeled an ammo this ammonia plume release with the, all the exact chemistry information that is known. And removal is a subject that Tom uh, Spicer covered, and as he pointed out, you can remove a lot of uh, a material from the plume if you have a reactive surface. Now, the, the, a lot of the chemists I talk to work with regional air quality models, and the emissions are from barnyards and fertilized fields and so on, and they have half-lives of chemical reactions between ammonia and other air pollutants that are on the order of a few hours, half hours or few hours. And eventually, this is important to realize, at some point the plume r stops being buoyant or dense or whatever and it just, it just approaches dispersion of uh, just an inert substance in the air. And that with these, even these huge sources, that happens within a few kilometers. And this underlying topography, that's something that is important, as I mentioned here, but I'll let uh, Jacques cover these topics in the next talk. And uh, another thing that we, uh, I guess you already know, and a lot the emergency responders really know, is there's a big difference between operational modeling and uh, which uh, can be done in, in the fire truck as you're on the way to the accident using Aloha or something like that. There's a big difference between that, where you have very little knowledge of input data, and then historical planning or research studies. For example, in the US, if there's a, a big chemical accident, the Chemical Safety Board springs into action and spends months analyzing it finding the data, how much was released, and do a, does a thorough analysis. But the, but the people that are rushing out in the trucks to the rail car accident, and the example, good examples are Graniteville and McDonough chlorine accidents, they didn't even know what the chemical was. And it's night, they're told there's been a chemical accident, there's a cloud, a rail car accident, there's a cloud out there, they're racing in there in their trucks, they don't even know whether it's ammonia or chlorine or, or what. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's very difficult in a real situation. The next thing I'm going to do is cover some of the widely used dispersion models. And the, what I'm taking is information from a paper I wrote back about 10 years ago where six of these models that are widely used were compared for three big rail car accidents for chlorine. This is only chlorine, Graniteville, McDonough, and Festus. And they all involve pressurized liquefied gas in a rail car. So the Festus, this was a, uh, one of the things Kent and, uh, and George were mentioning as a common scenario, it was just a hose break. So they're unloading a rail car, the hose breaks, and they ended up with about a three, I don't know, three to 10 tons getting out over a period of an hour or so, and these are photographs. But because this is chlorine and two-phase release, it ends up looking dense. You can tell it's, uh, the cloud is just right. Uh, I don't know, one of these pictures from Festus there was an emergency responder in his hazmat suit actually standing in the cloud. <laughs> so his feet were in the toxic cloud and his head was above it. The models that I'm gonna discuss are two proprietary models that are in wide use and four publicly available models. And one of these is Aloha, which has been discussed for its use in the Hypha scenario, 
and another one is Ski Puff, which has also been discussed. And I am going to be discussing them in alphabetical order. So there's no relation between the order and what I think is good or bad. So the Aloha model is, is available on the web. It's part of the so-called Cameo hazardous gas modeling system or hazardous release modeling system distributed by the EPA and NOAA. And uh, fire departments are trained in its use and, uh, and so they uh, will have it in the, in the truck and be running scenarios on the way to the accident, supposedly, or the local agency like the city could have it and could be running a, a scenario. Because it is, you, it is applied by people without specific training and transport dispersion, dispersion chemical uh, engineering, it has to have some things hardwired in it to keep people from making big errors in inputs, picking the wrong inputs. So like on the second bullet, it has simplified emissions, uh, scenarios for emissions and makes decisions internally about algorithms. So you, you do, just to simplify it, just put in chlorine truck, <laughs> transport truck, and it'll do a whole modeling scenario on that basis. And to be conservative, it doesn't allow plume rise. It assumes it's right at the, all the releases are right at the source. And uh, I have a little note here to remind you that if you think back to the Graniteville scenario I was describing where the emergency responders did not even know what chemical it was, you're safest when you're doing a quick analysis to just assume no plume rise because the plume rise would carry the plume aloft and give you lower concentrations. So if you really don't know anything about it's going on, you crank it through with no plume rise, the plume is at ground level. Now that's not the scenario we have here in Haifa because we know it's ammonia, we know what the scenarios are, so you can, you can be a little more uh, detailed in the inputs. So I wanted to stress again its major point, Aloha is the only model in this group that does not allow plume rise and assumes a plume centerline or maybe in ground level, which makes it well uh, quite conservative for anything that's a buoyant plume. So the next model and the next are all kind of similar. It was developed by Shell HG System, and they all have good science, jets, evaporating pools, extensively evaluated. It's similar to Tom Spicer's model, uh, Degadis. Yeah, I should have mentioned that Degadis, a simplified version, is contained in the Aloha version. The FAST model is similar to HG System, which is no surprise because the guy who developed HG System moved over to FAST. And, um, and it's widely used now. It's really been greatly advanced. Ski Puff is similar to FAST. And, a, and Slab is Livermore model. It's part of, uh, uh, it's quite an old model, similar to Degadis, basis for the EPA RMP rules. And trace is similar to fast. It's a proprietary model and not as quite a wide use as fast. So what I'm going to show here now is the predictions of these six models for the, the Graniteville scenario. And there were no observations. These accidents happen so fast and the cloud moves off within a few minutes. Nobody's out there taking observations. So what you see here is that the six models all kind of agree with each other. There's no huge outliers or anything. So that was one of the conclusions of the study. The next thing I wanted to do is show, uh, to discuss was evaluations of these models with ammonia field data. And there's not that many ammonia field data I'm going to discuss the two major ones, desert tortoise and jackrabbit one. And Tom Spicer already discussed desert tortoise, which was a 
they act the reason it's desert tortoise is all these field tests are done in the desert and they just name it after one of the animals. So there's desert tortoise, burrow, coyote, jackrabbit. That's why they have all these crazy names. So this was in 1983 and it was pressurized liquefied gas release. And you can see there's a couple of big uh, road tankers of ammonia and there, there's a nitrogen pad. And measurements were taken uh, out to distances of, well, I think this goes out to 1.5 kilometers, and Tom had some data to 3.5. There were four releases. They were all about 10 tons, on the order of 10 tons. This is what it looks like from the, a near-field photograph. And this is what it looks like from a little farther away. Okay, so this is ammonia, but it's not buoyant, it's not rising up. Well, the reason it's not is because it's a pressurized release and there's a large amount of liquid drops embedded in it, which make it dense and it takes quite a while for them to evaporate. So then we have the observations, which is the real, the heavy solid line. This is concentration versus distance. And the, uh, the three models are on there as dashed and small lines. The models kind of agree with each other. The, uh, it's interesting to see the concentration, and this was typical of all the four experiments. At one kilometer, the concentration ranged sort of in the neighborhood of 10,000 ppm. This is for a 10-ton pressurized liquefied ammonia release. Next experiment is Jackrabbit 1 in 2010. Again, it was pressurized liquefied anhydrous ammonia, this time one or two tons. There were five releases. The ammonia exhibited dense cloud behavior, but not as much as the chlorine cloud. We also did five chlorine releases, and they were shallower, denser looking than the ammonia. Chlorine, as it says, has a much larger molecular weight. Okay, so here's a photograph. Oh, two seconds after release, there's a, a tank, and the release was, was uh, pointed downwards, and there's the two-phase wall jet spreading out in all directions. And this is after a minute, and the release had mostly stopped by then. So the, here you have a, this is under light winds, you have just a big, uh, two-phase cloud in the neighborhood of the source with a de and the depth of the cloud is two or three meters or something. That's pressurized. Uh, the, and I'm going to close with the mi some minimal data I have on evaporation of liquid pool. This would be a gas release. And this experiment I'm going to talk about here, they mainly just were looking at this, the evaporation rate. And, uh, and there are several models that were developed for liquid pool evaporation. These are really uh, quite good now because all, that was all the initial uh, interest of the, of the modeling community was in LNG really. And so the models were mainly addressing evaporation from liquid spool, pools. So those got to be quite good. And this is just my last slide. It's the observed and modeled evaporation from, the, and this is a small scale refrigerated liquid ammonia spill. And by small scale, I mean really small scale. And it was probably about this big. And, um, and so the models for the evaporation once, uh, once they have been parameterized correctly can match that evaporation rate quite well. So that ends my overview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.